Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. It's a, a great event, as always. And it's my great pleasure now uh, to introduce Andres Arrieta. He is uh, one of our ME, very successful associate professors. Uh, Andres got his uh, BSME in uh, 2006 from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, and then a PhD in 2010 from the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. Um, Andres has been an exceptional scholar and researcher for us uh, in the school and uh, does most of his research at the Herrick Labs, which is a lab very close to my heart. Uh, his research focuses on exploiting structural nonlinearities to achieve intrinsic property and shape adaptability in engineering systems. Uh, his approach has resulted in very novel functionality of metamaterials, morphing wings, energy harvesting, and soft robotics. Uh, his, research uh, his research work has attracted significant funding uh, from the National uh, Science Foundation, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency like DAPA, uh, and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, uh, as well as industrial sponsors such as Anhäuser Busch, we all like that one, right? As well as uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, among others. Uh, he has been very productive, uh, lots of publications in, in journals, but in particular in uh, articles in Science, Applied Reviews Letters, and ACS Nano. Uh, he also has been very active in going to conferences and publishing peer reviewed uh, conference paper, just what uh, we expect from a professor uh, right, of his stature. He has already mentored uh, seven PhD students to completion, as well as 18 master students uh, to completion, which is quite productive uh, for this stage of the uh, career. And uh, his most notable awards to date is uh, the ASME uh, Gary Anderson Early Achievement Award in 2018, as well as uh, NSF Career Award. And it's my very distinct pleasure to introduce Andres Arrieta. Thank you, Eckhart. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, to be here. Um, it's really a privilege to be able to talk about my journey to many of my mentors, um, some of the people I look after, uh, to be able to, you know, as an as aspiration to go in their footsteps, and also to talk to my students, which, of course, are the ones who have allowed me to be here. Um, my talk is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to talk about my um, curiosity of discovering and how this uh, was a journey that, the journey that I take to become a professor. So I, want to, I wanted to make this uh, relatively personal and this was by choice. And it was a choice that I made because I'm relatively impersonal um, when I'm the university. So I wanted to show this side to my students and also to my colleagues um, and what motivates me to be here. So my motivation started by <laughs> looking at a KLM Jumbo jet um, when I was two years old. So I remember these, we went on a trip and I heard all my life that I was, um, well, not all my life, when I was a kid for several years, I heard that I was repeating all the time where is my KLM Jumbo Jet, KLM Jumbo Jet, KLM Blue Jumbo Jet. So somehow I really liked uh, Jumbos and I really like aircraft. And also when I was growing up, um, I had really a, a big privilege of having um, three grandparents that were looking after me. And in particular, one who was living with me and all the time feeding me with information. And some of the information was about science and about the solar system. So um, the first place where I started writing my name properly was on an astronomy book about the solar system. And on that time, we had still nine planets. And of course, I'm very sad <laughs> to say that I put it there on purpose um, to keep Pluto there. Now, of course, it's a dwarf planet, so it was degraded. But anyways, or demoted, sorry, not degraded. Um, these were things that I was really fascinated when I was a kid. And uh, when I started thinking about what I wanted to be 
um, when I was an adult, I, I was fixated to become an aerospace engineer. Um, but then I started to realize how life works. So I come from Colombia, and we didn't have, well, actually there was one aerospace program in Colombia at the time, but I understood that it was probably not the best to follow. Um, so I settled for in mechanical engineering. <laughs> and, and I took that choice because I knew that that was my surest path to be able to work on aerospace applications. Um, so while I was growing, um, you know, this is you know, uh, the late 80s, still the world was not globalized as it is now. So my parents and in Colombia it was hard to get Lego. So we had our own Colombian Lego, which is called Armotodo. And I was making spaceships that to me looked like this. Unfortunately, I didn't have any pictures of them, but I remember they were quite nice to me, and I played all the time with them. And the interesting thing is that these things were made for architectural um, uh, applications. So this started to form my, my thinking, I believe, in how can I connect and how can I use what is available to me to find the best path to achieving my goals. And my goal was to have a spaceship like this one. So then I used my um, armotodos that were given for us um, as a gift to do uh, buildings. Now, I'm going to be, make a big jump. I did go to Los Andes and I'm extremely grateful for my education there. It was really thorough and it really taught me some of the most important lessons that I've carried with me. One of which is uh, grit and uh, being humble. So when I went to Los Andes, um, and he didn't have pictures of that, unfortunately, but I remember the speech of my head of department. He presented the department, he told us how the um, uh, program was, and then he ended up his speech, and there were some cake and some refreshments on the back of the room, and he said, okay, everybody, um, I, you know, I wish you all the best and I hope you enjoy the cake and the drinks because this is the only gift you're going to have in the next five years. <laughs> and I always tell this to my students because it marked me. I understood what, what was needed to be successful in a place that was elite because Los Andes is an elite university and there was no gift, I assure you about that. And there were hard times, but it was really, really satisfying to be able to uh, raise the level uh, to the challenge and, and, you know, do the best that, that I could under those circumstances. And, you know, coming from a school in Colombia that is better known now than um, almost 21 years ago. Uh, no, sorry, well, that's when I was started, when I, when I left um, 15 years ago. It was hard to go to a place like, like the University of Bristol. And the story of how I ended up in Bristol is for another time. But um, I applied uh, there, and my two advisors, in particular David Wag, uh, believed in me and helped me to get a, scholar and a scholarship there. And it was really interesting. Uh, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about my research, but it was about these laminates that are changing shapes, such, just like slab bracelets. or now, uh, these Microsoft mouse, mice that you, some of you use, I know uh, Stuart has it, I saw it yesterday, and I bought it myself, of course, a bi-stable uh, mouse, it's, it's something that I need to have. Anyways, I was working there on things that change shape, and uh, things that change shape dynamically, because in my undergrad, I started to be very interested on dynamics and controls. And this allowed me to work on something that was close to my um, childhood dreams, which is aerospace applications, and <laughs> at some point my dream was to put this on a large aircraft, which is, you know, a little bit too much. But anyways, it kept me going for some time. Now, after, after my time at Bristol, um, I was very fortunate to meet Professor Peter Hagedon, which I know Arvind also knows, and there in, in Darmstadt I deepened my knowledge in nonlinear dynamics and vibrations, and afterwards, I was extremely um, lucky to be able to go and work with uh, Professor Paul Ermani at ETH Zurich, 
now on things that look a little bit more to what I wanted to do with my uh, childhood dream. So we were able to develop some interesting applications on morphine structures and had um, my first opportunity to uh, mentor students and um, uh, meet other uh, you know, incredible uh, human beings uh, there. So then I started to you know, think a little bit about what I wanted to do. And it took me some time, but I, from my astronomy and physics uh, times and talking with my, my brother, I was very interested about fundamental, um, con fun fundamental phenomena. And I got um, involved or I started to play with these um, dome pattern sheets, which maybe some of your kids or some of you have on these um, puppet toys. And I wish I had <laughs> uh, patented these uh, before um, because they are really, you know, uh, now everywhere. But anyways, it's still really interesting. So if any of you have played with these, you'll know that it's very interesting. Um, these, uh, it's called the metamaterials, are reshaping uh, when you start pressing on them. And then they have this hysteretic behavior that is very interesting. But when I started playing with these, I didn't know uh, what, was, what these were leading me. Now, um, it led me to something that uh, it's my second big point that I want to make. It's the interconnectedness that you find in everywhere in science and in life. So I had no idea that these dome met pattern metamaterials, when you press them, and their reconfiguration was related to a very fundamental phenomenon called geometrical frustration, which is the uh, inability for a lattice system or a system of interacting um, particles to minimize their interaction energies um, simultaneously. So there is classical example of a lattice made of triangles. So if these uh, triangles are thought as, let's say, uh, magnets, and they want to be aligned antiferromagnetically, so they want to be one up and one down, you can arrange two um, of these guys in the triangle but the three become frustrated. And frustration, it's also an important part in our lives. It was in my life, being a hyperactive kid, I gave a lot of frustration to my parents when they, were, when they needed to go to school because I was, you know, messing around. And now it forms an, uh, an interesting part of my life. I started finding frustration everywhere. And in particular, when you have all these uh, lattices where these elements are interacting and are frustrated that it cannot be minimized at the same time, you start having these states of degeneracy. And degeneracy essentially means that you have many possible states. And this happens in many different systems, starting by water eyes, colloids, magnetic systems, and even in some structures. And then what I was extremely happy to know is that this um, geometrical frustration and the many stable states that you find in these systems and in the sheets that I play with come from uncontrolled degeneracy. So this is a connection with the fundamentals. And when I teach my uh, ME274 class, ME270, I try very hard to give my students a motivation of why it's important to learn the fundamentals. And I also try to tell them the connections between different fields. Because when I started looking at this, at this problem, I would have never guessed that, that it appears in you know, condensed matter physics, in quantum physics with Goldstone bosons. Um, and it was really fascinating for me to see all these connections. Where is this ball going to fall on this Mexican hat um, potential? This is the question. And it can fall and, and, and stop in any of those points and this is what it's called degeneracy. You don't know where you're going to end up. In the same way that I didn't know that I was going to end up at Purdue. Very interesting how life pushes us and breaks symmetries. And, you know, uh, we, we end up in, in some state at the end. So I want to tell you that it's very important to have your eyes open, to connect, and to find interesting opportunities and look hard to uh, reach out beyond your own comfort zone, which is what I'm doing here, because I'm no quantum mechanicist. But 
Um, it's been very interesting to, to draw some of these connections. And this has allowed us to start playing with these sheets and find order and find ways to control these geometrical frustration um, and create functional elements, like for example, a robotic gripper that uh, it's a little bit more functional by um, this leveraging of the order in which these domes are uh, inverted to reach one of these frustrated states that is more, more um, beneficial for a certain manipulation task. And you know, to my great shock, one of the other nice works that I've done, and I'm very proud of it, was my uh, connection with biology. And this is another point that I want to make. Being multidisciplinary in thinking, it's extremely uh, important in the current world. So I was extremely lucky to get to know about them, um, Earwig Wing, and it was serendipitous. I went to a breakfast with Professor Barry Trimmer, who was visiting us. I told him I work with multi-stable structures, and he said, oh, do you know the Earwig? And he was like, I don't know what the Earwig is. Do you know what the Earwig is? Some of you may know it, right? I didn't know what, I actually knew what it was in Spanish, but I didn't know the name in English. Anyways, I started looking at the earwig wing, and so it happened that it has some specific properties that made it by stable, specifically that um, this wing can be looked as a, a four-facet origami system, but the creases, spaces between the facets, um, stretch, and this is what we found and led us to, to, to discover how the earwig wing um, for, on faults and faults. This is a, a, an FE simulation. What is extremely interesting is that this behavior of the stretching of the creases and the popping up and down that it leads, this bistability, it's also connected to frustration. And you can see it by trying to put together in 3D tetrahedra. They will form six, um, the, the, each vertex is going to come um, into, into a six, um, each, each vertex will share six uh, sides of a tetrahedron. And this is because this adds to 360. In, U, in Euclidean space, the um, addition of the angles, when you have, um, verti um, when you share vertices, need to add to 360. So if you try to put, for example, five tetrahedra together, there is going to be a missing angle. And this missing angle is the same missing angle that creates the popping up of, on the earwig, and again, my frustration appeared. So it's very interesting how absolutely by luck, because I didn't know about this before I started studying, these main contributions of my work um, up until here were connected. It's really, really remarkable. Um, this work in particular also highlights some of the other things that I think have really helped me to come here, which is I've really had the, the, the luck of being in different countries. I, was, I did my PhD in, Ger in uh, Great Britain, my postdoc in Germany, and was re re group leader in Switzerland, and had some time in uh, New Zealand, and seeing all these different ways of doing the same thing by different uh, peoples really helped me to understand diversity, appreciate diversity of approaches and diverse, diversity of backgrounds. And this has led me to put a lot of effort in um, helping with internationalization and collaborations as uh, my contribution to the, my department and, and the college. So we have done some study abroad, outreach uh, uh, to minority engineering, and also I had the, the, the privilege of going with um, Ding Chang to Colombia to try to enhance our collaborations with uh, universities over there. Now, um, I think that I don't have too much time left for this, so I will go to the end. Um, and is how I measure success. So I didn't have um, any metrics here, because my metrics is um, to see my students having fun. And also receive from my friends and my family their appreciation for my work. This is the metric I use, and this is what really gives me and drives me uh, every day. 
So these are just a collection of, of uh, pictures of things that happened in my lab, our first um, conference in, in numbers, our first barbecue, um, my first doctoral hat. So this is a tradition that I'm trying to bring from my time in Germany and Switzerland to my, um, to my lab, my first hooding, um, first trip to Chicago, and uh, you know, here are most of my students uh, without whom I wouldn't be here. And you know, it's my privilege to be able to mentor them and share with them a little bit of the journey that brought me here. Also have to thank all my sponsors, which of course help, not help us, support us and, and allow us to do the wonderful things we do. And finally, I want to thank my family, which uh, had to deal with my frustrated uh, with my frust with my um, frustrating behavior as I was growing up. Um, particular, my granddad, who's, who's hundred, he's going to turn hundred and one in a few days, um, and his example uh, really was uh, consequential and fundamental to me being here. So thanks, everybody, and yeah, hopefully, I can take some questions. Thank you, Andres. That was uh, truly wonderful. Very, very informative, but also a, a little bit entertaining. Uh, um, questions for Andres? Yes. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing the story. Yeah, it's just a story. Thank you so much. So this is Yu. I'm assistant professor from uh, industrial engineering. So my background is also robotics mechanism design. So I saw uh, this very interesting design, shape morphing, shape programming. Uh, I wonder if you briefly comment about, you know, uh, the challenges and the opportunities in shape morphing in, say, in robot applications. Yeah. Okay, yeah, th this is really, really wonderful. So, um, let me tell you how, how I got there. So I was working on morphine wings, which uh, tried to change the shape of a, an extremely optimized system, a wing structure, hyper uh, light, and where the shape change, uh, a little bit of bad chain shape destroys the behavior. So then I thought, okay, maybe I find a relatively simpler problem, which, and then I started thinking about soft robotics or compliant robotics. Why is that? Because maybe it didn't have to be so lightweight. The shape uh, was, didn't need to be so extremely precise. And we started working on it. And what I have learned is that, of course, this was not true. Uh, the challenges are equally uh, hard. Now, what is very interesting about uh, compliant robots is, and for us, is the opportunity to um, simplify their functioning by encoding properties into the structural system. Um, and when I talk about properties, it's functionality, such as control and actuation. So I think that um, as engineers, we naturally try to solve our problems by using techniques, combining different types of systems, and then you know, using all our tools to make it work. Um, but this begets complexity. And I think that this is one of, of the challenges of our time, particularly if we want to see robots everywhere. They cannot be complex and they cannot be very expensive. So uh, an opportunity is how do you make robots more um, robust and simpler, and how do you make them affordable such that they can be really deployed everywhere? And this is what's driving me in trying to uh, come up with interesting properties that allow you to have um, encoded reconfiguration encoded controls. Um, we call it encoded mechanologic um, to be able to have a simple input uh, that by modulating it in time, so this is connected to the order of the pressing of these meta sheets, allow you to go to different types of final states. And I, I'm very happy to see that Milind was here. He helped me to understand that this is a type of higher level logic uh, that it's just finite state um, machines type of logic, which for me was relatively new when I started looking at it, but it gives an opportunity to simplify the system greatly. So I see that uh, making affordable robotics, um, it's, it's a great opportunity. And the challenge is, is how do you encode sufficient functionality uh, to make it work? 
And, and, and uh, we try to do that by simplifying the system as opposed to maybe uh, make it more complex. Yeah, I'm Barrett Caldwell for, um, from Industrial Engineering. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a very speculative question that actually goes back to your Colombian Lego. All right. Um, there's some, been some recent work looking at the uh, sound propagation on Mars, looking uh, at the um, speed of sound calculations from perseverance and ingenuity. And apparently, because of the nature of the atmosphere, it's a biphase speed of sound with a transition in the acoustic range. If you are building a spacecraft or a structure on Mars, do we have a geometric frustration problem if the speed of sound changes in a region that we might expect vibrations? I'm completely blown away by your question. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I will be a fool if I try to respond technically. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. But, but it's extremely interesting. It's extremely interesting. And, and this is serendipity happening, uh, you know, uh, as we speak. So I cannot give an intelligent answer to your question, but I'm going to make sure to find out what's going on there for sure. You'll hear from me. <laughs> This is incredible, yeah. Any other yeah. questions? I'm sorry that I cannot give. Uh, of course, uh, I expected Mang to have a question, you Why know. Uh, no, I, I don't want to uh, have any misconstruction uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not uh, paying attention to this talk. Uh, uh, by the way, great to see you again, Andreas. Uh, I still vividly remember our journey together with a few other colleagues to Colombia uh, and uh, and rest assured that uh, while there are aeroastro-inspired mechanical engineers, there are also a large number of uh, mechanical-inspired uh, aeroastro uh, <laughs> uh, uh, colleagues and students as well. So, you know, on the topic of uh, Columbia collaboration, just wondering, you know, since the trip we took, uh, which was, uh, what, three years ago or so, um, and visiting a few universities and tried to create a pipeline of exchange students in uh, master and PhD students said, how is it going and uh, what more can we do? Well, that's, that's a wonderful uh, question, uh, Dean Chang. Um, I think we have got their momentum when we went. It, this was uh, October 2019. And then we all know what happened uh, in March, right? So everything uh, came to a ground halt so do, through the pandemic. But um, during the pandemic, um, Right before the pandemic, I was uh, at Los Andes, and it was very, um, you know, extremely lucky to recruit one of my students who's here, who's uh, Juan Osorio. He's from Los Andes, uh, and we have kept the connections. I I met with my uh, bachelor thesis um, advisor last December to try to reignite um, the exchange with students. Of course, we're hosting now. Nicolás is here from uh, Universidad Nacional on the Europe C program. Um, but I think that uh, we needed, um, we really need to, to, to reignite the, the connections. And what uh, we discussed when I was last uh, there is that um, we need to have an articulated, um, articulated sequence uh, that allows also the professors from Colombia leverage the time that their students come here. And this is, for example, having um, six months here, then going to surf, and then they returning to finish their, their uh, thesis there so that they, so the publications can be done. And one of the ideas that we talked about was to have this symposium or, or small conference back in Colombia with the uh, students that come here, uh, that do research such that we can showcase it to other students in the universities uh, because they, they know about it, but it's the impact of having a symposium uh, would allow us to, to have men, much more interest. So I think that uh, this has not happened yet uh, and we, hopefully we, we, can, we can try to do it for next year. So that's something that is on my, 
on my bucket list, although it's not really um, you know, something that I have, let's say, ultimate power to do, but I'm pushing for it. Thank you. I think we're almost out of time, right? Is that correct? Or... Because uh, my follow-on question to this is, right, Andres, you are recruiting from Colombia, right? uh, and me personally, I have a few students from Germany always floating around for some reason. Right, but how do we expand this? How do we get others involved to, to really right, uh, uh, make it more of a, of a global effort or, uh, right, than just maybe on this personal relationship that, we, that we're trying to build? I think that's... That, uh, yeah, yeah, this is, this, is, this is the challenge. So I can tell you a, a sad story for us. Um, when Juan applied, uh, one of his colleagues, which was... Um, a mechanical engineer, and he also did physics at the same time, which in Los Andes is not a mean feat, and got extremely high grades, applied to Purdue. His uh, GPA, uh, if you just translate it to uh, percentage, was 91%. 91% in mechanical engineering in Los Andes is top 2% of the past 10 years. But nobody offered him an RA here. He was in fluid dynamics. So the problem is that we have to do our uh, you know, go beyond to really learn the systems and maybe be more proactive in our graduate committees to have international uh, professors that have this local knowledge to flag up these students more um, vigorously and, and be champions for them to come. So he is now in Denmark, right, Juan? Um, at DTU. It's a little loss for us, I, I think. So I think that we need to do uh, more targeted recruiting. So what I, what I was describing, have a symposium at the university. People will see our names. We have to have some faculty there to, you know, to give weight to the symposium. And then when the opportunity comes, we need to uh, grab them. Um, and I think that this is maybe what happens, a little bit of lack of, of knowledge. And, and we all are very busy, so it's very hard. But I think that... Uh, there is, um, talent is really universal, and we really need to look everywhere for it. Great. Thank you very much. I think I will close it out now. Avin, you want to have the last word? Thank you again, Andres, for a wonderful presentation Thanks. and remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Eckhart. And uh, as Andres mentioned, he and I, uh, academic uh, brothers in a sense, coming from the same postdoc experience in Germany. So this is it's nice to see. Actually, I heard about Andres before he even applied here. You know, my postdoc advisor at the time said, hey, you know, you got you to gotta look out for Andres, you know, so I'm really glad it all worked out here. Um, well, this is the last uh, celebrating our associate professors event of this uh, spring semester. So I'd like to thank all of you for participating. It's been a fantastic series. And uh, Oh, yes. We have a lot of uh, colleagues uh, and friends online, so big thanks to all of them as well uh, for joining us. Uh, big thanks to the committee, all the people who've organized uh, this event, uh, certainly to uh, Ed and the AV team here, to Marsha, Maria, and Amy, uh, you know, that have uh, actually very successfully carried out these um, uh, these events. There's a lot of work, as you know, uh, there's a lot of customized outreach to all the mentors. Uh, you know, there's special emails that go to specific individuals asking them to apply. So a lot of work goes on. Uh, so please uh, uh, join me in thanking the honoraries as well as those who helped make this event possible. Thank you. Thank you.